Last week I came on and I spoke about my nuclear lake experience and um, Vic invited me back again this week. So I just wanted to discuss my um, Green Goblin experience with you guys this week. Hi, everybody. My name is Al Santariga. I'm the founder of the Bronxville Paranormal Society. And my paranormal experience happened in 1995 while on the job working. I was a mailman in North Yonkers, and I was told to hold down a certain route. The carrier had been injured, and I was um, asked if I wanted to hold down this particular route. This was a great route. The carrier who had it, he was a senior guy. He had a really good route. Mostly all buildings except for a few residential houses on one side of the street, maybe 30 houses. Everything else were buildings, and it was in a really, really high end of the city. You know, like the mayor lived there, and the commissioner lived there, and it was a really good neighborhood. There was no crime or anything like that. So I started carrying the mail. So I would park my car at the beginning of the route. The truck driver would drop my mail, and then I would work my way towards the end. And um, I was told by the original carrier, the regular carrier, who told me, he said, listen, when you get to the end of the route, walk back to your car on the street. Don't take the bridle path back to the car. It was a path that was created It was an aqueduct, actually, and it was created to run water from the Catskill Mountain Range down to New York City. And it ran behind all these buildings and all these homes down in Yonkers. And it was a really, really long path. It went from down in the poor section of town through the middle class and up to the high end. But he said, don't take that path back to your car. Walk the streets, which didn't make any sense to me because if I was to walk back to my car where I parked it originally when I started the route, it was like a mile and a half walk back to the car. If I took the aqueduct, it was only a mile. So I'm going to take the aqueduct. So I started doing the route, and uh, you know, it was nice, beautiful neighborhood, big buildings, really, really high end neighborhoods. All these condominium buildings had pools, doorman, the whole nine yards. And the homes were really big Victorian type homes. So I would start off, it was an older building. It was the first building on the route. And the aqueduct came out to the street that um, went to this building. Now, for some reason, I've always noticed there was always parking in front of where the aqueduct came out on both sides of the street which was great for me. I didn't have to battle looking for a parking spot and the building was right across the street where I started. I didn't understand why there was always parking there, but I wasn't looking a gift horse in the mouth. So I would go in and I would do this one building and it was an older building and it had a west side and an east side. And on the west side, one of the residents was a state judge. He was like a Supreme Court judge from New York State and we became really friendly and everything. And on the other side of the building, which was the east side of the building, which ran, the aqueduct ran along, his daughter lived on the first floor, and she was a young girl. She was an attorney down in Manhattan. And so we would, I would always see her on the weekends, and we would say hello, and we'd talk. And I noticed that um, if you went down that aqueduct and you looked at that building, all of the uh, apartments for the first three or four stories, it was about, I would say, a six-story building, all had metal cages around the windows and it didn't make any sense to me because this is a high-end neighborhood that was low crime there was always at least two police cars on the block at all times and it's just like what's going on with this big cages around these windows if there's a fire these people can't even get out but then right across the street which was the first private home on that route was a ex-nfl football player there was an alignment for the new york jets and uh, he would live there alone. And uh, originally he lived there with his wife. And then uh, when I met him, I would stop and talk to him every day. And we'd talk football and NFL. And, you know, he was like, when you finish with the route, come back, you know, we'll hang out some more. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, by the time I got finished with the route, it was like five o'clock at night and it was time to go home. Because, like I said, these buildings were all humongous and they got a ton of mail because everybody in them was... Uh, somebody important so they got a ton of stuff 
So I'm delivering the route every day. I got doing the buildings on the west side of the street that all face the Hudson River. And then I cross over and I do the buildings on the east side of the street that face the aqueduct. And the last complex was a condo complex, which was all outside delivery. And it was set up like a giant square. And all the all the apartments faced the pool, like the court. Um, but when I finished with the last house, I would take the aqueduct back to my car. And I did this for months and never had an issue. And then one particular day, I'm walking back to my car. And I noticed what was really weird to me was like once I got to all the private homes, all the individual homes, and there was only like 30 individual homes on that block, all of these homes had like 10 foot fences that faced the aqueduct. And every single one of these homes had these killer dogs. I mean, it was a Rottweiler, it was a pit bull, it was a German shepherd, it was a Dublin pitcher. And I always just say to myself, thank God I deliver in these houses in the front and not the back because these dogs would kill me. And so one day I'm talking to the football player, you know, and I was like, what's the deal with all these fences and all these killer dogs, you know, I said, I don't understand. This is such a great neighborhood. There's always two cops parked on either side of the street. You know, why, why all these, uh, you know, and he says, Al, let me tell you a story. He says, when I first moved in here years ago with my wife and kids, I was playing for the jets. My wife got up one night to um, use the restroom. And while she was there, we we only had like a, a five foot fence in the backyard and we didn't have a dog. He had a Rottweiler at the time, but he didn't have a dog at the, when he first moved in. He said she went to use the bathroom and when she was washing her hands, she looked out the window. It was a nice moonlit night and you could see the aqueduct crystal clear. She said she's seen that looked like a guy jump over the five foot fence and go towards her back door. So she came in and woke him up and he went downstairs and this guy was huge. He was like six foot seven, you know, 350. He was a big dude. And uh, he said, I went downstairs with a baseball bat thinking somebody was breaking in the door. He said, when I looked out the peephole, I couldn't believe I was seeing with my own two eyes. He goes, Al, I didn't even open the door. And he goes, I called the cops. I said, well, what? What did you see? You know? And he was like, how do I explain this thing to you? He said, it was about six foot tall. It was green. He said, it had, looked like it had an exoskeleton on the outside, but the belly looked almost alligator ish. He said, it had alligator hands and feet, three toed. He said, and the hands had really huge claws on them. And this thing was digging through my back door, which was wood at the time, trying to get into the house. And he started, you know, like banging on the door with the baseball bat, you know, trying to scare it off. At the same time, he called the cops. His wife called the cops. The cops came because they were always like a block away. And um, this thing ran off into the woods. And the cops told him, you know, don't worry. It was just, you know, a prowler or something. And he was telling the cops, this thing was not human, you know? And he was, they were like, listen, we know we've heard this story before. That's why there's always two cops cars on this block. What we recommend is you get another five foot fence, make that fence 10 feet tall, get yourself a big guard dog and change the wooden door to steel with no windows. And this guy's like, are you nuts? Well, you know, this freaked his wife out. And she said, well, I'm not living here with my children. I'm not raising my children here. I'm moving back to Alabama or something, you know, and you can live here when you're playing, but then come live with us in the off season. At this point, he was retired, though, and his wife was separated. So he was living there full time. So I said, man, this is a crazy story. So I started asking all the neighbors as I got to each house. Saturday was the big day. Most people were out in the yard cutting grass, trimming their bushes and planting flowers and stuff. So I would run into a lot of the residents. Um, and I started talking to all the residents. And then one particular home was a safe house for like um, battered women. And this older woman lived there. She ran the safe house. And she had, she actually had two pit bulls, an older one and a younger one. And I was talking, I called her big mama and 
the way these houses were set up, they were like a hundred feet from the street. So you had to go up like a hundred steps to get to the front door. And I would help her up with her groceries sometimes on Saturday. If I was going down the street and she was coming up because she had a lot of groceries with the women that came and went and we got to become really good friends and we were talking. So she says, Al, let me tell you what happened one night. She goes, before I had the high fence, I had the pit bull, you know, it was my pet. The dog was my pet. And one night where we everybody went to bed, all the lights went off. Something jumped over the fence and started clawing its way through the back door. Now the dog heard this and the dog charged downstairs, you know, do what the dog is supposed to do, protect the family. And the dog was going at it with this creature and this creature was cutting the dog up because he had clawed its way through the door pretty good. Both of its arms were through the door and uh, the dog was fighting it and the dog was getting in. Everybody came downstairs, big mama and all the women that were there and they grabbed whatever they could brooms and mops. And they started beating on this thing and uh, through the door, pushing it away. And they called the cops and the cops came and this creature ran off into the woods and actually, the cops saved the dog. They put the dog in the police car and they brought it to an uh, emergency to get surgery because the dog was just cut up to all really bad. I mean, this poor pit bull, if you would have seen it, you thought it was a fighting dog because he had so many scars on him. But this all happened because of this incident. And it really took a lot of life out of the dog. And that's why she felt she needed to get a, another one, a younger dog. And I was like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. And I'm delivering the route and I'm getting these stories from all the neighbors and everything. And one day I'm walking back to my car. And like I said, those two spots at the end of the aqueduct that intervened the street were always wide open. No one ever parked there, but I parked there during the day. I, I'm walking towards my car and, I'm, you know, I'm still quite a ways away from my car, maybe a half a mile or something. And I feel like something is following me. And I turn around and I don't see anything. And I walk some more. And I've always had this intuition, this gut feeling that I call it. I don't claim to be psychic by any stretch of the imagination, but I always had this good, my whole life, I had these gut feelings. And I just felt like something was definitely following me. But I, every time I turned around, I couldn't see. And I noticed as I started getting closer to the car, walking past these homes, all the dogs would run to the fence and just go absolutely insane. So that was my red flag that something was definitely behind me. So at one point, I grabbed both cans of pepper spray that I had on my bag. I always carry two. And I ran to a spot in the bushes where I felt this, whatever was there, I felt it was at this location. And I sprayed the bushes down, turned them all red. And I figured if there's something here camouflaging itself, if it moves, I'll know now because it's. I turned all the bushes red, but nothing ever moved. And I got back to my car, and I, you know, drove to the local deli and got lunch or whatever. And um, so then, as time went on, I'm doing this one particular building. It was two condo buildings that were connected by an outer breezeway. And they were both faced the aqueduct. And uh, what I would do is one building was you had to deliver it from each floor. You would go to the and when the elevator opened up, it opened up to an outdoor breezeway kind of thing. It was it was you would get you faced the breezeway. And at the end of each floor, the apartments at the end all had like terraces, you know, all the way up to the roof. And these buildings were really beautiful buildings. There was pools on the roof, the whole nine yard. They had courtyards, really, really. But this first building that I had to deliver, I had to go to each floor because the mailboxes were right on the outside of the elevator. When you got off the elevator right there, they weren't in the lobby. Each floor had its own mailbox group. And uh, one day I'm delivering the mail and my back is ter towards the aqueduct. and I happened to be on the floor with the breezeway that connects both buildings. I think it was like the second or third floor. I think it was the second floor. And it also looked over the courtyard. And it had a beautiful courtyard, really, really big courtyard with picnic tables and barbecues set up and everything. And it had a 
this really high retaining wall, maybe an eight foot retaining wall that held back the aqueduct. And sometimes when I would deliver those buildings, I would see like one furniture on the aqueduct, like a chair facing the building. And I would say, who is sitting on the aqueduct and that lawn chair facing the building? Like who's sitting there looking at this building? That's pretty creepy, you know? So one day I started, I became good friends with the maintenance guys. You know, I, I was holding that route down for like a year and I became good friends with the maintenance guys. And I was like, what's going on? Why, why do I see one chair on the aqueduct? And one of the Spanish guys said to me, oh, because he called it Chupacabra. He said, because Chupacabra lives in those woods and he sits in a chair and he looks at the building and he tries to figure out how to get in. And he goes on to explain to me that this creature would climb up the patios because all the patios on both ends of the building were all wood. And he would climb up the patio and he would try to break into apartments. And he said one time he was up on the pool checking the pH level in the water. So he was at like the north end of the pool checking the pH level. And he said when something came out of the water. He said, he didn't see, it. it was invisible to him. He said, but something came out of the water and left footprints that looked like alligator tracks towards the edge of the building. And he said, I don't know if this thing jumped off the six story building onto the aqueduct or if it climbed down the side of the building. He said, cause I couldn't see it, but I seen the footprints from leave the pool. I seen something come out of the water, the water split. And this dude, he, I didn't know what a chupacabra was at the time. So when I went back to the post office, I sat down with all the Spanish guys and they educated me on chupacabra. So I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting, you know. But according to the Spanish guys that worked, the chupacabra was very small. It was like two, three feet tall. And according to these guys who worked in the maintenance department, they said the creature that they see is like six feet tall you know it's like a six foot creature so i was like this is pretty crazy but i always it didn't stop me from taking the aqueduct back to my car every day and um when winter time rolled around i started delivering the buildings out of my car i would just pull into the driveway and park in a visiting parking spot and take the mail out and deliver it this way. Just wouldn't have to walk back because the whole walk back from the last building to the car would have been in the dark. And I was like, I'm not walking down this aqueduct in the dark. So one day I'm delivering the first building and the young attorney, the judge's daughter comes in and she comes in with this giant German shepherd and this dog looked like he wanted to rip my throat out. And I was like, when did you get a dog? You know, like th this dog, she could barely hold it back. You know, she was like, I'll go to the other side of the building, you know, go to the, to the West corridor of the building. Cause I can't hold him. So she went, she brought the dog in the house and then she came back out because she wanted to get her mail. And we started talking and I said, like, when'd you get a dog? You know? And she's like, Oh, you don't know what happened to me uh, last month. I said, what happened? She says, well, you know how there's only ever two spots on this street right in front of the aqueduct. And I was like, yeah. She said, well, I was at work down in the city and she drove a really nice like Porsche and everything, you know, and she goes, there was no place to park on the road and the building had limited parking. And she's like, um, I had to park in front of the aqueduct. She said, I came home late one night. It was in the wee hour. It's like three o'clock in the morning. And I got out of my car and uh, her building actually had a foyer to you. You walked in the front door, which was a heavy wood door. And then it was a foyer with a locked door on it. And you got into the main lobby. And she said, when I got out of my car at three o'clock in the morning, I seen in the darkness, like green eyes flash at me. And she thought, because I thought I was hallucinating. She goes, we were out partying that night with all the young girls at the law firm. And she goes, I thought I was hallucinating, you know? She said, then out of the darkness, I heard something running towards me. So I took off running towards 
the building. She goes, I got into the front foyer. When this thing hit that foyer, sent me flying off the door. I bounced off the back door, back onto the front door. She said, and this thing put its hands in, and I seen these giant claws. She said, I pulled out my mace, and I maced it, you know? And she said, that gave me enough time to get the other door open, the lobby door with the lock on it, and get behind the glass door. And she goes, and then when I got inside the lobby, this thing came bursting through the front door. And she said it was, it was, she thought it was like an alien or something. She said, I didn't know what it was. And it just freaked her out so much. She told her father. And in New York State, it's like impossible to get a carry permit unless you're a judge. Well, her father got her a carry permit so she could, she'd have a gun on her all times, you know. And it turned out that the more I investigated this thing and the more I dug, the more everybody in that area knew about it. And that's why the cops were always sitting there. Not that there was a high crime neighborhood, but there was a lot of reports of this creature. And the cops were always two minutes away. You know, like I said, with the mayor living in that area and the police commissioner and, you know, this state uh, Supreme Court judge living there, it was there was a lot of juice living in that part of town. So she said, my, you know, father got me a, a gun permit. I'm carrying a gun now. And I went out and I got this big dog because, you know, I take the dog everywhere with me because I'm petrified, you know. And she said, the thing actually ran around the side of the house, down the aqueduct, towards her window and started pulling on the metal screening that caged that she had around her window, trying to rip it off to get there. I guess it could smell her scent. And it tracked her to her apartment, which really freaked her out. And um, she called her father and her father came down with his gun and took some shots at it through the window. And the thing ran off and the cops came. It was, you know, it was a whole big deal, but it kind of got brushed under the rug because of who he was, you know. So I, I'm like freaking out. I can't believe this story I'm telling you. I'm hearing, you know, now. As the fall rolls around and it gets darker, and I'm delivering the mail. And I noticed that the women who lived in the building, when they went to get their kids from school, as soon as they got out of the elevator and it was starting to get dark, you know, around dusk, everybody would make a beeline to their apartment door. They couldn't get in their apartment doors fast enough. And I also noticed that all the buildings that faced the aqueduct had a big turnover. A lot of people would move in, stay six months and move out. But across the street, the buildings that faced the Hudson River, no one ever moved out of those buildings. So I was like, why is there such a big turnover, you know? And apparently people were coming out of their elevator and they would see this thing on the aqueduct looking at them. So one day I'm delivering the mail and I was on a different floor. I was like on the fourth floor and I felt like something was watching me. And I looked at it. I looked at the aqueduct and I couldn't see anything on it. It wasn't dark out. It was still light out. It was late afternoon, maybe four o'clock. And I'm looking at the aqueduct and I know something is looking at me. And I say to it telepathically, I know you're out there and I know you're looking at me. I can feel your energy. I know you're there. So why don't you just show yourself to me? And then it did something that I didn't expect. It flashed its eyes and I seen these big green eyes light up, almost like a yellowish kind of green. And I was like, oh, okay, there you are. I knew you were there and I knew you were looking at me. And I was like, why don't you show yourself to me? Show me what you look like. And um, at one point, it materialized out, out of thin air. It materialized and it looked, it had this green exoskeleton look to it. I had never heard of reptilians or insectoids at the time you know wasn't really into that stuff at the time 
And I found out through my brother, I called my brother, who's a parapsychologist, and I sh- explained to him what it looked like. And he said, it sounded like more of an insectoid creature than a reptilian. I said, yeah, but it looked reptilian. Its belly looked like an alligator belly, and it had alligator feet and alligator claws, but its outer skeleton looked like an ant. So I called it the Green Goblin because it kind of reminded me of the Green Goblin on um, the Spider-Man movie. So then I went down to the courtyard one day. Again, I felt I felt it was there watching me. This time I was on the second floor, the breezeway. I went into both buildings and I felt it was watching me. And I was like, you know, I don't know what this thing wants with me, but I've had enough of it. And um, I went down to the courtyard and I'm sitting in the courtyard and I'm looking up at this retaining wall, which is eight feet high. And then this thing materializes. And again, it's a six, it's got to be between five and six feet tall. So add that on top of an eight foot wall and it's skying over me. And I just feel like this thing has the advantage on me because it's so much taller than me. You know, he's got the high ground. So I went up on one of the picnic tables to make myself appear bigger to kind of even the size wise. I'm not that it did anything. It only lifted me up like another three feet, but I stood there and I stood there with both my, I had my hand on both of my maces and I looked at him and I said to him, what are you? What are you? Are you an alien? What are you? And it just looked at me and I think it was trying to intimidate me, but I wasn't being intimidated. I was like, no, you're not freaking me out, man. You're not scaring me. I was like, what are you? And he was just looking at me and the vibe I got. Now, I don't believe that it answered me telepathically, anything like that. But the vibe I got was that it was a cave dweller and it lived underground in a cave. Now, there was a lot of This area in the city back in the roaring 20s and stuff, there were a lot of caves that were dug through the woods that led down to the river because they used to run illegal alcohol. When the prohibition was in there, they used to run illegal alcohol through these caves onto boats and then bring them down into the city. So I know there's quite a bit of cave systems in these woods. I don't know where they are. I don't know where they come out to down on the river, if they're even there anymore. But I know at one point they were there because I know people who used them, you know, back in the roaring 20s and stuff, you know. So um, I know they're living in these caves. I don't know if they're living in those particular caves or if they're living in other underground caverns or whatever. I don't know if it's alien that's been here with thousands of years if it's interdimensional or if it comes from inner earth but the only thing i could say is the vibe i got was that it was a cave dweller i don't believe it was alien per se like extraterrestrial now it may have been interdimensional but not extraterrestrial because when it was digging through the doors to get into the houses, it only dug through the wooden part of the doors. With its claws, it could have went right through the window without any problems. But I don't think it knew what windows were or glass. You know what I mean? So once these people would replace the wooden doors with the steel doors, it was done trying to get in. But they still had windows that faced their backyard. I mean, if the thing really wanted to get in, it could have jumped through a window. And um, I think the dogs were enough of a deterrent to keep that thing out of their yards because the aqueduct was so long. It ran for about 10 miles. And I found out later on as I started doing different routes. Now, all of these routes, a group of these routes were on this same particular street. This street was a very long street, was 10 miles long. And the aqueduct, ran from the most northern part of that street all the way down into the main square where it actually goes underground, where they put it underground. And I noticed 
that no matter what neighborhood I was working in, whether it was an upscale neighborhood or the middle class neighborhood or even the poor neighborhood, everybody who lived in those neighborhoods knew about what was out there. And everybody would say to me, hey, man, don't take the aqueduct back to your car. Walk the street. I mean, even in the hood, the guys wouldn't even walk there. And this would, these neighborhoods got really rough. I mean, there were times where I would go to deliver mail and people would be fighting pit bulls in the courtyards, you know. But these guys, as bad as they were, wouldn't even take their dogs on the aqueduct to walk them. It was like, no, I'm not going on the aqueduct. So this whole street or this whole area in North Yonkers knew there was something there. Now, whether there was more than one, I don't know. But... um that was my Green Goblin experience from 1995. Craziest thing in the world. Unbelievable. Thank you. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's myparax.com. Thanks for listening.